Hello, I'm Ilan, and today we're going to talk about the books that I used in music school from beginner all the way to doctorate. I am a classical pianist, composer, and teacher. I completed five music degrees in piano performance, most recently graduating with a doctorate in music, and the schools I attended were all in Canada. If you would like to know more about me, or you want to check out the resources, links to my website with everything mentioned is in the description. Titles and timestamps are also in the comments. The resources I'm sharing today were either assigned or suggested in the courses that I took. This video is not sponsored or administered by any publishers or companies mentioned, and I do not endorse the use of all of these books since some we only used a few chapters or exercises rather than reading it cover to cover. This is merely a compilation to show you some materials we used in case it might be useful for your own research or studies. Today's resources will be theory and research based. There will be a separate video for practical piano playing materials. Alright, let's get started. First up is material related to the Royal Conservatory of Music with their practical and theory examinations, which I began in elementary school. I completed levels 1 through 10 and their diploma level, which was an ARCT in piano performance. For basic theory, I started with the keys to music rudiments. There was a textbook and thin student workbooks with exercises. When I got to what is now called level 5 piano, we used the elementary rudiments of music, which covered preliminary rudiments, grade 1 rudiments, and grade 2 rudiments, which became basic intermediate advanced rudiments, and now theory levels 5 through 8. This book has explanations of each concept and then exercises. There would be numbers or letters which represented the levels on the side. Some sections were all three levels, but others applied only to the advanced rudiments, so there would be a certain amount of skipping around in the book. For levels 9 and higher, which are considered advanced levels, there are multiple written exams as co-requisites. Here's a chart of what it looked like when I was studying and the title changes since then. For harmony, we used the basis of harmony. Each end of chapter had exercises, but not ones you could fill out directly in the book, so I had to hand write all of them on manuscript paper and then complete the exercises. Most of my work looked something like this. There used to be a dedicated counterpoint exam, so we used elements of 18th century counterpoint. RCM has since gotten rid of the dedicated counterpoint exam and merged it with the levels 10 and ARCT, which is why those exams are called Harmony and Counterpoint. For music history, the textbook we used was the Enjoyment of Music 9th edition, which covered the overview of Baroque to Present, which was History 1 at the time, now it's called Level 9 History. For Level 10 and ARCT, we kept the same books and my teacher supplemented chapters from other books as well. One thing I did like about the Enjoyment of Music textbook though was the front and back covers, which listed all the pieces used for listening and recordings so you could search it up. There were CDs that could be purchased that had all the excerpts. And there were timelines, images, and the listening analyses are blocked off so you can easily find them by color. Sometimes there would be a nice chart breaking down a piece or concept too. After I graduated already, RCM made these workbooks for harmony and history. There would be some explanation summaries along with exercises and charts for students to fill out themselves. For all these RCM written exams, past theory exams are available to purchase so you can practice before the actual exam. One of my teachers even had some from 1993, which is quite the extensive collection. The old books used to have three exams plus an additional practice examination. The most recent papers, unfortunately, only include the exams within the past academic year, so December, May, and August, without the additional practice paper. There are now online theory and history courses which have practice tests included. The length of time you have to complete the final exam is different than in-person, and assignments are also weighted differently depending on the course, so best to do some research if you decide to go for that route. If you want to check the current syllabi, they are freely available on the RCM website so you can see the curriculum. As a side note, the physical copy of the theory syllabus doesn't include this, but online there's a theory syllabus addendum that lists some resources if you're ever looking for more books. More about online resources later. Okay, on to undergraduate degree. For the baccalaureate in music or bachelor of music in piano performance, we'll start with mandatory courses. I had two years of solfege and dictation, which were full year courses, two classes. The dictation part had all the students in the same room and the professor played intervals, chord progressions, rhythms, melodies, etc. for us to notate. There was also this ear training, a technique for listening, 7th edition revised, which we had homeworks to go to the library and listen to the CDs that had exercises to complete. For sight singing, we were in smaller groups. We used Music for Sight Singing 8th edition. Unfortunately for me, if you were taking this course in English, they used movable dough. I have perfect pitch, so fixed dough is significantly easier. For those less familiar, fixed dough means the letter names and solfege syllables remain constant. So C is always do, D is re, E is mi, etc. Whereas movable dough changes depending on the scale degrees or number of the note in the scale you're using. For example, 
If I'm in G major, fixed Do means G is Sol, A is La, B is Si, whereas movable Do, G becomes Do, A is Re, B is Mi, etc. This textbook has both rhythm and melody excerpts. We'd be assigned a certain number per week to prepare for class. Then for exams, we'd go in one by one with the instructor and they'd select from a long list. The further you get in the book, the more complicated the rhythms, there's a new clef to read or it becomes atonal. I still refer back to this book whenever I need sight singing exercises. Next is two years of music theory, four sections or courses. I always hand wrote my notes. So this is two magazine files among many shelves worth of Hillroy notebooks. As you can see, the bulk part of these courses were handouts or scores we had to print ourselves before class to analyze. In first year, we used Music for Analysis 7th edition, which contains excerpts grouped by similar concept and included a CD so you could listen to those excerpts instead of playing them yourself. In second year, it was mostly printing sonatas and orchestral works along with handouts. We'd have quizzes for chord spelling, and then later in the semester we had to apply it by analyzing the forms and structures of larger works. Then there were five sections of music history. Normally you take four sections of history in the first two years, and then the fifth section of history alternated between being offered in English or French, so you'd time it to take your language of choice. I wanted to finish my compulsories right away, so I took it in French in third year. As the main textbook, we used the Norton A History of Western Music 8th edition. We also had to get these anthologies, which contained little summaries, but mostly scores. The blue one is ancient to Baroque, second was classic to Romantic, and third 20th century. We also had to get these anthologies, which were strictly scores, classical music, romantic music, and 20th century. Here's a music history study and research tip. Oftentimes these big textbooks have e-learning or online resources. Some you have to access via a portal by entering registration numbers that are included in the book. However, what I used to do was just search around on those websites anyway and see what they have freely available. The thing that helped the most was finding the chapter outlines that the authors, research assistants, and or their team have made because they're the ones who wrote the book. Especially nearing exam time when you're looking through an overwhelming amount of notes plus listening exams where they give you a 20 second clip from anywhere in an entire work and ask for follow-up questions. And the playlist is somewhere between 20 to 40 hours of music and it's just a lot of days of listening. So if the resources are already there, you might as well use them. Here, for example, I have a history of Western music. Mine was eighth edition. Now I guess it's the 10th edition. I click on resources and there are all these chapter outlines that are PDFs. You can print those and add your own notes or elaborations depending on what is required in the class. And if I go to the further reading tab, this first link is, quote, not a comprehensive listing of resources available on each topic, but rather a collection of the most significant or helpful recent publications, which can serve as a starting point, end quote. A starting point that I may add is 296 pages. After a quick search, the Oxford History of Western Music has chapter outlines and quizzes, and so does the Concise History of Western Music, which this interface is more familiar to me because the eighth edition I used used to look like this as well. As a piano major, I also took choral ensemble, accompaniment, collaborative piano, piano ensemble, keyboard literature, chamber music, along with a lot of other courses that were electives. Alongside piano performance, I also did composition, but all of these courses were handouts or score-based, so I'll talk about those resources in a different video. Graduate studies. For the mandatory introduction to musical research for graduate studies, we used music research, a handbook. This lists print and online music research tools, including library catalogs, music encyclopedias and dictionaries, periodicals, dissertations, etc., and more information about writing, style guides, and citations. We had to keep a long annotated bibliography on a subject chosen at the beginning of the course, so there were several hundred entries to submit by the end of term. I worked with a fair number of vocalists during my undergrad for lessons, diction classes, coachings, etc. So these books were relevant throughout, but on paper, the official courses I took were for art song, leader interpretation, and collaborative piano classes, which worked with instrumentalists and vocalists, primarily opera and art song, but also a bit of musical theater for the vocalists. This was during my master's, artist diploma, and doctorate. It is very likely that vocalists will need to sing in different languages in a classical program. We had to sing in at least five or six languages for choral ensemble, even as non-vocal majors, so translation was a must. Diction for Singers, second edition, helped with the pronunciation of sounds in English, Italian, Latin, German, French, and Spanish. There are guidelines for each letter and example words spelled out in IPA, IPA being the International Phonetic Alphabet. The Interpretation of French Song by Pierre Bernac 
there are summary texts, but also translations. The thing I quite liked is the liaisons are written in, syllables that might need more emphasis or underlined or remembering to break from certain punctuation. All of it is notated so you can reference it. If you're looking for leader translations, there's the Fischer Dieskau Book of Leader. This time it's German text translated to English. Last of this set is Song, a guide to art song style and literature. It gives a survey of art song literature, and there is an extended study list, selected reading, and notes for each section or composer. If you've ever had to write program notes for art song, this is a really useful resource. By program notes, I'm talking about these programs you might get at concerts you attend, which have information about the pieces you're about to listen to. Sometimes it gives historical context, the structure of the piece itself, maybe a translation of the poetry, a small biography of the poets or composers, but some useful or relevant information. Miscellaneous books. For composition and orchestration, I don't have a copy on hand right now, but we use the Study of Orchestration 3rd edition, which showed the characteristics of orchestral instruments, which instruments to choose, etc. if you are creating a full orchestral work. The Inner Game of Tennis, the classic guide to the mental side of peak performance. There is an Inner Game of Music, but I remember the preference was for the tennis version, which was recommended as a read in a sort of business of music course that covered a wide range of topics. Next is What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body. This is more of an anatomy book in a way. It shows how the entire body is involved when playing piano and also discusses body mapping. There is a mixture of diagrams and explanations. For music appreciation, there's What to Listen for in Music by the composer Aaron Copland. Under the same-ish category, but for 20th century music, there's The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century by Alex Ross. I took a seminar during my master's on the second Viennese school. It was a lot of journal articles, but there were also some chapters from this book, Theory of Harmony by Arnold Schoenberg, a rather hefty book. If you're looking for a biography on Brahms, this was a go-to Johannes Brahms, a biography. This one is all text. The bulk part of my doctorate was practical courses and specialized seminars, so I'll group those resources with the online section. My thesis was on Maurice Ravel. At this point, I was going to the library to take out all the books I could. At one university I attended, I was allowed to borrow 100 books to keep for the whole semester unless someone else put a hold on it. So, naturally, I borrowed several shelves worth of books. If you want to see the bibliography or read my thesis, I made it available on my website so you can peruse since this would be a whole video by itself if I continue talking about Ravel. I even have photos I took at his house in montfort la maurie in the thesis, so please check it out if you would like to know more about Maurice Ravel. Where to access or buy physical resources. Some very kind professors will leave a copy of the textbooks on reserve in the library so students in that class can borrow them for reference. Usually those copies have to remain in the library and they have a time limit, but you don't have to pay to access it. There are also often CD sets with exercises or recordings that go along with the textbook, so those were at the library too. If you need a book or score and can't find it at your local library, try university or college library. Some places you don't even have to be a student at that institution to borrow books. If you can't find it there, but you've searched WorldCat and it's available in another city, try interlibrary loans at a library that has that service. In terms of purchasing all these books, if you do want to buy them new in person, try the university bookstores since professors may have sent them a purchase list. Although I did have a few professors who supported local bookstores close to campus, which was nice, so they might send you to a particular bookstore to purchase instead. It can clearly get very expensive if you're buying all of your books new, so oftentimes university bookstores will have buyback programs where they resell people's books, so you can check if said bookstore has a used copy. Sometimes they mark it on the edge or put a used sticker, but it's all the same content on the inside. There are occasionally university library or just local library book sales. This book, for example, was somewhere around 120 Canadian at one point, reduced to 60 or 70. I got this for $5. This is also how I got a bunch of classical vinyl records for 50 cents or a dollar each because a library was downsizing their collection. Of course, there are websites you can easily search, which I won't list, but it's also nice to browse and support local secondhand bookshops since you never know what you'll find there and you're surrounded by books, which is lovely. For online resources, this will be a mix of topics. One thing I'll mention is that a lot of universities will revoke your access to these journals and academic sites after you've graduated, so if you get a chance to before you graduate, download all the files you think might be useful or relevant for the future. 
For citation and style guides, we used the Chicago Manual style throughout all my studies. The only time we used MLA, which is Modern Language Association style, was for English classes. Otherwise, everything else was always Chicago for music-related research. I can't talk about music research without mentioning JSTOR, which has academic journals, books, and primary sources. As of December 2023, when I'm recording this video, you can make an account and read up to 100 articles every 30 days online for free. Most institutions and even some high schools will have access where you can download the articles without any limits. Otherwise, for the general public, it's paywalled. Worldcat.org is a database slash catalog of library materials. This is where I mentioned to check in case you wanted to do interlibrary loans or just wanted to see which places might have a copy of a book or score. I will again recommend the e-learning and online tools available with textbooks that you can sometimes freely access, which I mentioned earlier with the history textbooks used during my undergrad. There's the Canadian Encyclopedia for, you guessed it, Canadian research topics. RISM is Répertoire International des Sources Musicales, is a database that documents written musical sources, so it tells you what exists and where it is kept. For the Society for Music Theory's online journal, it is Music Theory Online. For open access theses and dissertations, oatd.org. For medieval music, there's the Digital Image Archive of Medieval Music. For vocal chamber music on an Italian text, there's the Cantata Italiana database. The Bibliothèque Nationale de France has a digital library, which you can find gallica.bnf.fr. For musical and theater, there's the Internet Broadway database, IBDB, and playbill.com, which has a vault. The National Film Board of Canada has some free online streaming if you want some films to watch. And if you're looking for old program notes, some venues will post digital programs prior to concerts. Some have archives up to a certain date. So if you're checking for layouts or word counts with the latest artwork and names of musicians, take a look there. If you're looking for scores or sheet music, try IMSLP, the International Music Score Library Project, which has a huge collection of public domain scores available. Obviously, check the copyright status in your country. The servers are hosted in Canada, so they follow Canadian copyright law. There's Choral Public Domain Library for public domain choral music. For early music, try Early Music Online. If you're looking for 19th and early 20th century scores by women composers, there's a collection held at the University of Michigan Music Library. If you're searching for Canadian works, try the Canadian Music Centre to peruse, borrow, or buy. For Felix Mendelssohn and Robert Schumann, among others, and manuscripts available, there's the Munich Digitization Center, MDZ. For Mozart, there's the Mozartium. For Schubert, Schubert Online. For Brahms, there's the Brahms Institute. For Chopin Early Editions, there is the University of Chicago Library that has a collection. And for the Beethoven House in Bonn, there's a digital archive. For manuscript scans, IMSLP has some, there's also the Juilliard Manuscript Collection, and the Library of Congress Music Treasures Consortium. If you're into jazz music and want to find which fake book a particular song is in, try seventhstring.com, which has a fake book index. For text translations. Translations of Lieder and other classical vocal works, there's Lieder.net. For a collection of information about opera and operatic arias, there's the ariadatabase.com, although they aren't updating much anymore. IPA source. If you're a vocalist or collaborative pianist, or even a composer if you're writing for singers, this site has the text in the original language, the IPA right underneath, and the English translated word under that. This is one of those sites where saving while you have access is recommended because it is paywalled. For recordings, the Internet Archive has books and a live music archive. The Library of Congress has the National Jukebox, which has historical sound recordings. Naxos Music Library has a huge collection of recordings, which a lot of local libraries have access to, along with all the institutions. The Great 78 Project is a, quote, community project for the preservation, research, and discovery of 78 RPM records with over 400,000 recordings, end quote. You can find it at great78.archive.org. You can also just listen to online radio stations with playlists. Some universities have their own radio stations as well, so those can be fun to check out. To watch recordings of live concerts, your local orchestras might also have free live stream performances. To watch recordings of live concerts elsewhere, some are subscription-based, some institutions subscribe as well, so check there. 
or some allow you to watch on the day or a few days after the actual concert and then lock the videos. Some examples are the Digital Concert Hall, which is the Berlin Philharmonic, Medici.tv, or the Met Opera On Demand. The next titles will be a speed run only because they're paywalled, but institutions will likely have access, so check through your university or college library. Garland Encyclopedia of World Music, Realm Music Encyclopedias, Realm Abstracts of Music Literature, Grove Music Online, Oxford Music Online, Music Index, which you'll see as EBSCO, Index to Printed Music, Music Periodicals Database, which is previously the IIMP, the International Index to Music Periodicals, ProQuest, ProQuest Dissertations and Theses Global, all of which are useful for music history, musicology, etc. There is Drama Online for full text of plays, DRAM Online, and finally the Jazz Discography. There are loads more that I have not mentioned, but they will be listed on library websites. When I started a new school, I usually go to the library and figure out the layout. If they have library tours, which they did for free at all the institutions I attended or visited, I would sign up because the librarians know where all the materials are. If your department is lucky enough to have a specialist in your field, go ask questions when you have them. There's usually someone who is making acquisitions as well in the library, so it doesn't hurt to make the occasional request so they know there is a demand for a certain book or material. If you're writing a research paper and you're stuck on finding sources, university libraries will often have research guides. Search Music Guide Library and the name of a university and you'll have plenty of titles and links to get you started since they will have already done the research for you and curated lists by category or subject. Okay, this has been a far longer video than I had anticipated, but I hope this is enough information from my experience with several decades worth of books and resources for music theory, music history, and research. If you made it this far, thanks for staying till the end. If you found this video helpful and want to support this channel, I have two albums currently available to buy or stream. There are also PDFs in my shop and links to other ways to support in the description as well. As always, thanks for watching and happy music making.